Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Elias. I'm one of the Spine Fellows here at Swedish. I'm finishing up my fellowship here, and I'm going in a couple of weeks to University of Virginia. So I'm honored to present today my future chairman, Dr. Mark Chaffee, <clears throat> who is going to give us a talk about uh, spinal cord ependymomas. Uh, I will give just a brief bio of, of uh, Dr. Chaffee. So he was appointed in 2006 as professor and chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at University of Virginia. He completed his MD and neurosurgical training at UVA in 1994 with Alpha Omega Alpha. And then he did a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, the NIH in microvascular physiology and clinical neuropathology. He is also trained as a skull-based surgeon. He did a fellowship in Slovenia and he served as a registrar in England. Uh, Dr. Chaffee also served as the chief of neurosurgery at uh, the Kiesler Medical Center as a scholarship obligation for the United States Air Force uh, where he was decorated with the Meritorious Service Medal in 97. After this, he returned to UVA and he founded the Neuro-Oncology Center and the, Neuro the Neurosurgery Clinical Trial Office. He also co-founded in 2010, the UVA NIH residency program. He is very active in research. His interest mainly is in neuro-oncology, spine surgery, and the outcome of patients with both, uh, with both entities and has more than 200 publications and has been a principal investigator in over 50 grants and clinical trials. He also serves as an editor and reviewer for multiple journals and have been named or elected to many societies and currently has been elected as, the American, as an American Board of uh, Neurosurgical uh, Surgery Scholar. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Chaffee. Thanks, Elias. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And I appreciate uh, the invitation to, to speak, you know, in a, what I consider um, uh, really a sister institution, um, really stands for clinical and academic excellence. And it's such an honor to be asked to, to speak at uh, your virtual grand rounds this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, some, something that really, um, really has been a lifelong interest of mine, at least career long interest, and that's spinal cord tumors. You know, I, I've always been, as Elias said, uh, interested in tumor surgery, also have developed over time a, a strong interest in spine surgery. So what better uh, topic that overlaps than uh, spinal cord tumors? And so it's a passion of mine and hopefully be able to say a few things that uh, maybe uh, uh, warrant your time this morning. Um, you know, as I said, we've shared a lot of things. One of the things I didn't think we'd share was the weather. And I, I, I feel terrible for you that you're having Charlottesville type of weather in Seattle. It looked like you were gonna get a break today and I hope that's the case, but I walked out a couple of days ago and it was 102 at six o'clock here and it was hotter uh, in Seattle. So um, I, hope, I hope you guys will, will have weathered the storm and doing well. So I have no financial disclosures. Uh, the only disclosure that I do have is one that my brother has labeled me. He said, either you can be a tumor surgeon or you can be a spine surgeon, but you can't be neither fish nor fowl. And you know, um, I found this uh, graphic online, you know, that is, you know, both fish and fowl, and I found it very interesting. So I think, you know, as someone who uh, aspires to be both fish and fowl, uh, you know, keep my, my uh, comments in, in that perspective. So a little bit about, about closer ties between UVA and, and uh, Swedish. Uh, this is someone I'm sure you're going to be familiar with. This is uh, Steve Monteith, his graduation photo. I kind of checked my records and saw uh, what was in my email. And there was this nice announcement about Steve when he uh, won uh, this nice NREF FUSS award. I think when he was in the lab, here's uh, one of uh, the graduation party for Steve. And I think here uh, when Steve was, was finishing with, of course, Dr. Jane, 
um, you know, in the in the center. And of course, Dr. Jane is someone that has tied our institutions together as well. And uh, you know, it was very uh, unbelievable what you know Swedish and uh, SSF did uh, for Dr. Jane and lectureship uh, when he passed. Um, so uh, again, something that really has tied us together. Well, here's here's some photos that I had in the files on Rod. And this is Rod's uh, the group photo and we all got together in front of the UVA Medical Center. So you can see Rod here. Rod is a junior here. And this is one of my favorite photos in, in neurosurgery. So uh, this was a photo, I think when Jason was finishing as a, uh, as a uh, chief resident, Jason Sheehan, where they all got together and got to look tough, you know, and Actually, Ashok Asagari, who's our head of neuro oncology, he really kind of looks uh, pretty intimidating. And uh, uh, but I was looking at, and I said, "Well, Rod, you know, even if he if he tried to be mean, it's just not in his DNA. I mean, Rod still looks like the nicest guy on the planet, which is true. But don't let that fool you, because uh, you know, Rod will get after you. Here he is putting Dr. Jane in a headlock, you know, in a in a, mo a light moment." But I mean, I think it highlights two things, which is how much um, mutual admiration uh, Rod and, and Dr. Jane had for each other, which is really something special. And then lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, someone who's going to be uh, a brand new neurosurgeon, you know, who is Tony, Tony Wong. Tony's a great guy, you know, he, he's so, He's so quiet, just gets the work done, gets everything uh, taken care of. He's gonna be a phenomenal asset uh, to your health system there. And I don't know if he's able to be on or just making him transition, but just wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, get a shout out to the, the new guy. There's Tony as a, as a junior resident when, when this group of residents was finishing. So, you know, obviously I like to talk about history. Uh, there's this guy here, you know, if we were alive, you know, people would probably shout out his name, but this is uh, Sir Victor Horsley, who in 1887 operated on the first uh, spinal tumor. And it's really amazing when you think of it, 1887, you know, it was eight years before Rinkin, uh, uh discovered the use of diagnostic x-rays, 34 years prior to Sicard and Forestier's report of myelography. So based on, uh, on exam, uh, he operated on a 42-year-old patient with a T67 uh, thoracic tumor. Now, this was likely, probably in retrospect, the schwannoma or meningioma. But this patient uh, improved, was able to dance again, and lived 20 years before he died of, of uh, other um, complications uh, not associated with the surgery. And one of the things that, uh, when you read the account of this surgery, that's interesting is that it's the humility to listen to the people around you. So Horsley was gonna stop the operation. Sir Charles Balance said, no, let's extend the incision. And I think we can find this and they did. And it was a successful operation in 1887. Almost 25 years later, uh, this guy uh, came into, into the picture uh, and he's a little bit harder to, to place, but this is Charles Ellsberg, who is a neurosurgeon in New York. And he did the, in 1911, the first resection of an intramedullary spinal neoplasm. And uh, this is his monograph that was published in, in uh, 1925. And I'm lucky enough to have a first edition copy of that. And it's really fascinating when you look at people in this era, the trailblazers, you know, what they were able to do and what they were able to discern and some of the ideas that we still use today. Well, Ellsberg, you know, at the time when he published this monograph, had this two-stage theory where he would first go in, open the dura, perform the myelotomy, and then based on the oncotic pressure of the tumor, allow it to extrude and come back and remove it. So, you know, although we don't do that uh, intentionally these days, uh, it's still kind of a very interesting, and really uh, shares the principles on why these tumors become symptomatic. Uh, let it to be said, even in the early days, that people didn't get along. Uh, Ellsberg was not well liked in the in the community, and people had some choice comments about him. But 
that did not deter him from uh, doing what, uh, what he loved, which was taking care of patients with spinal cord tumors. So let's just jump in now to, to uh, intermedullary uh, spinal ependymomas and really talk more specifically about those. Um, patients generally present with symptoms. A high percentage of patients have symptoms, a fairly small percentage of patients uh, uh, these tumors are incidentally found, and we can talk a little bit about that. But of those patients who present with, uh, with symptoms, a high percentage of them have neurologic deficits if we look for them. And the presenting symptoms, uh, the number one is actually pain. Uh, it's a little uh, more rare for a patient to come in and say, I have a, a weak arm or a weak leg, although it does happen in about 30% of the, uh, the cases. Of those patients that present uh, uh, for care initially, if you do a careful neurologic exam, a high percentage of those symptomatic patients will have motor weakness, segmental sensory loss, usually due to uh, searings or fluid accumulation within the cord or sometimes bladder dysfunction. So a very high percent percentage of patients have neurologic deficits. And if you look, uh, in series like this one by Mark Bart and his colleagues about what happens if, you know, of all the patients that present, what happens if, you know, a, a cohort of those patients opt for conservative management? And what happens is not something that's statistically significant. So what happens happens slowly. So this is the modified ranking score, uh, rank and score of patients with initial presentation. And you can see about um, oh, you know, 78% uh, of patients, you know, presented with uh, MRS of zero to two and a smaller percentage uh, uh, MRS of three. And over time for that cohort of patients that were followed a, a median of uh, 48 months, you know, about the same number, you know, are zero, zero to uh, two on the MRS, but there is a percentage now that have progressed to MRS three and maybe what's a little more concerning to me is there's a group now that were MRS zero that are now either MRS one or two. But overall, that was not st statistically significant and just something to kind of file away as we see these patients and how we're gonna manage them. Again, this is a table from that same article and you can see that the McCormick classification gradually increased and a percentage of patients that went on to progress from uh, MRS beyond zero to two definitely occurred. So uh, when we think about the timing of surgery, uh, one has to see if you, if you look at the literature and you have personal experience that the natural history of these intramedullary ependymoma is, is progressive neurologic deficit, albeit it can happen very slowly. And I think almost everyone would also agree that uh, almost always the post-op uh, outcome can be very closely correlated with a pre-op deficit. Um, although there's a percentage of patients that will improve, stability of disease or worsening can occur. And the more challenging or more difficult the case, the more likely that's going to happen. So the question remains, how early, you know, do, do I tell patients that they need to go next week or they'll be paralyzed? Absolutely not. And there are people out there who will say that, but it's certainly um, not based on my experience or based on the literature. And then I think that there are, um, you know, the folks like me that believe probably uh, even maybe more so than imaging, once you get the initial imaging, that really neurological symptoms play a role. If patients are relatively asymptomatic, it certainly doesn't have to be an immediate operation. In fact, I find smaller tumors, very small tumors, more challenging than the larger ones. But I mean, again, preservation of uh, their uh, neurologic function should be a primary, primary goal. So if you ever want to do a lot of something, you know, one of the keys is really publishing a review article in, in a journal that a lot of people read. So a number of years ago, I was asked to, to uh, do a review article on intramedullary spinal cord tumors in Lancet Oncology. And this is just a table from that. But really, the, the reason why I dragged this out of there 
is really to, to highlight the difference when we look at an intramedullary spinal cord tumor, we're really thinking about it surgically. How are we gonna to prepare to do this operation? How big of a surgery we're gonna do? And distinguishing between ependymoma and astrocytoma is really important to do. And can you do that 100%? No, but can you do it You know, way over 90%? You probably can. Astrocytomas tend to be uh, a problem in younger patients in the first couple of decades, uh, pendymoma a little bit later, uh, spinal cord ependymoma. You know, as far as cystic de degeneration occurs frequently in um, spinal cord ependymoma, also with peripheral hemorrhage that you can see on heme sequences or, or T2 uh, hemorrhage and cystic formation, uh, particularly above and below a tumor. Are very less, very much more uncommon in astrocytomas. But the real key, I think, is the difference in preparing between a patient who has a great surgical plane, potentially, and one that's not going to have one in a spinal cord astrocytoma. So the approach is going to be different. You know, I, I'm much more likely to do a smaller operation, a limited laminectomy in an astrocytoma, and look at that debulking. And if you look at the outcome, uh, in the literature that we publish about astrocytoma, generally the extent of resection doesn't correlate with outcome and survival in spinal cord astrocytoma. Perhaps, you know, the ones that are more challenging are the anaplastic astrocytomas and GBM. Uh, you know, it says that 20% in the literature is that, but it's certainly been much less common in my practice. So, again, this is just kind of a reminder that for our purposes, that virtually all spinal cord, intramedullary spinal cord tumors enhance. Um, nothing generally looks quite like uh, uh, spinal cord ependymoma. I mean, they're centrally located. Uh, they enhance mostly homogeneously, but can heterogeneously. But if you look at astrocytomas and others, they uh, hemangioblastomas, they tend to have a different appearance. And of course, METs to the cord lymphoma are, are very rare and rarely are mistaken for uh, spinal cord ependymoma. Just a, a, a few additional features on, on the radiology. Um, cervical and thoracic tumors are virtually all of the cases. You, there can be a, a, a tiny number in the conus. You know, certainly seen a couple over 30 years, but certainly not too many. So generally, you know, they are in the cervical of the thoracic cord and a, a pretty, pretty significant majority in the upper thoracic and, and the cervical cord. Uh, the, as we said, one of the things for sure is that generally we will see edema, which can cause symptoms or can cause uh, syringomyelia. Uh, but the central location is really one of the things that is really almost 100%. Uh, we can see these fluid collections, rostral and caudal, to our tumor. And, you know, again, although all enhance, um, not all of them are homogeneous. They're not a, all a bright white spot like a hemangioblastoma would be. And I would say, you know, over the years, I've seen, you know, a half dozen, maybe more cases of, uh, of tumors that, uh, of quote unquote, spinal cord tumors sent to me that are uh, enhancement after uh, dinging the cord on a, uh, on a spondylitic ridge. I had a guy, who, want, who did 500 sit-ups a day and would pull his head forward. He had degenerative change. He had enhancement in the cord. And of course it turned out, I said, no, nah, we're not gonna operate on this uh, right now. And I said, stop doing sit-ups for a couple of months. And of course it went away. So just remembering there are other things like inflammatory transverse myelitis, uh, demyelinating disease that can enhance. So everything that enhances is not a tumor, although almost all tumors enhance. So. Um, just to show a couple pretty pictures of, of, um, of pathology, because we all love that, especially people who, who've been to UVA. Uh, it was a passion of Dr. Jane's. We have a great division here, but most, you know, 95% of ependymoma are WHO grade two. Uh, so spinal cord intramedullary tumors, obviously there's a significant percentage of all ependymoma that are mixed of papillary and WHO. HO grade one, but those are going to be in the region of the conus. I mean, the uh, the phylum or the tip of the conus. So, um, so about fifty percent of intramedullary uh, tumor will be these WHO grade two tumors. 
And then a smaller percentage will be WHO grade three, which are tend to be very bad actors and difficult to control. So here's a, uh, one of our nice pretty pictures of a WHO grade two tumor and to remind people that uh, rosettes are very common, but not the true ependymal rosettes, but rather these uh, ependymal pseudo rosettes that are centered around blood vessels. So I saw these are courtesy of Dr. Uh, Beatrice Lopez, who, you know, some of the crowd will remember her name, you know, who have been uh, affiliated with UVA before. And so I asked her, you know, what, what's the ratio of pseudo rosettes to true ependymal rosettes? And she said at least 100 to 1. So the others, the true ependymal rosettes uh, that really form a lumen from ependymal cells, very uncommon. And things take a very much a shift into a different gear when we talk about WHO grade three. You can see the aggressive nature of these with nuclear atypia, with uh, endothelial proliferation here in these tufts. So a whole different kind of tumor and a much more scary concerning appearance. And if you look under high power field, you can see um, you know, uh, um, these uh, uh, different uh, uh, signs of cell division where we're seeing uh, uh, these uh, mitotic figures. And of course, we can do our staining with T67 or another MIB1, you know, that tells us, you know, it's a much more highly proliferating tumor. Uh, we know that the genetics of spinal cord tumors are way different than, than um, those of, of their cranial counterparts. There's different drivers, you know, there's this relo fusion protein and, and, uh, and uh, uh, pediatric and, uh, and cranial um, ependymomas, but those we, we tend not to see in spinal, spinal cord uh, ependymomas. This was a series that was published just a couple of years ago in scientific reports, which uh, is a publication of Nature. And they said that over about 16% of spinal cord gliomas had NF, NF2 mutations. We know that patients with NF2 can have spinal cord ependymomas uh, associated with them. Although I think this really underestimates the number of NF2 mutations that we see, they combined a number of uh, spinal cord ependymomas with astrocytomas. And of course, the percentage of astrocytomas with NF2 mutations is gonna be low. So this number is probably somewhere between 25 and 40%. Uh, when you look at the literature, certainly a driver of, of tumors uh, of ependymoma within the spinal cord, but certainly does not explain all of them. So let's get into the meat, which is the surgical management. You know, what, what's our goal? Well, this is a curable tumor. So gross total resection is a goal. And uh, if we can, preservation or improvement of neurological function is, is really at the top of the list. I mean, these are both number one, right? And then of course, we need to make the tissue diagnosis, although usually when we start, we know what we're getting into. So this is kind of, you know, your standard uh, case, you know, that I'll see, you know, here's a T1 unenhanced kind of hyper to, to ISO intense on T1, enhances nicely. And if you look at the D2, quite a, quite a significant amount of uh, rostral and some caudal um, uh, tumor you can see here. And we're just gonna kind of sk skip through a couple of, uh, of uh, videos here, if I can get it going, here we go. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, number one, when you're approaching one of these tumors is identification of the midline. And that can be done in a lot of ways, but, you know, looking for the microvasculature that emanates from from the uh, dorsal median sulcus is the way that we usually use. We try to sparingly take any vessels on the cord, but sometimes it's unavoidable. And then, you know, I'll use a sharper forcep of some kind to develop that dorsal median sulcus between the, uh, uh, in, in between the two dorsal columns. At times, the, the uh, pia can be quite sticky. And so, you know, although I started out using a diamond knife you know, at times I'll use the micro scissors to open that up. And you know you're doing well when you can see those micro vessels on either side of the dorsal column. You know you're splitting right down the middle. 
it's not uncommon that as you're dissecting, you'll get some degradation in, in your SSEPs, but that's a topic we'll cover um, in a little bit. And again, I put this little diagram of the uh, spinal cord and the tracks up here, just to remind ourselves the important ones that we're gonna see. The first one, of course, being the dorsal columns. So let's talk a little bit of, uh, what did it that? Oh, I just wanted to mention too, at the end of that slide, you know, if you get a really dilated spinal cord, big syrinx, I mean, you're using neuromonitoring, use it for a reason. I mean, you can stimulate the dorsal columns and record either distally, or you can stimulate and record proximally and look at a phase reversal. And as you move from lateral to medial, you can easily map up the, out the spinal cord. So if you get one of those difficult uh, cases, don't hesitate to use your neuromonitoring for another purpose uh, during the operation. So here's uh, the, di the dissection phase. And you know, developing this plane a lot of times is not challenging. Uh, they really want to come, as Ellsberg pointed out, they really want to come out. But you know, it's always important to remind yourselves of where the cortical spinal tract is and the spinal thalamic tract. And really remember the, the lasting deficits that are going to be important likely are going to extend uh, from, the, from that dissection that's laterally as you head around to the anterior part of the cord. People do these differently. You saw, you know, debulking the tumor, whether you do it by scissors, whether you do it by uh, just touching it with an ultrasonic aspirator is really important and helps you develop that really pristine plane between the spinal cord and the tumor. Um, you know, the times you really get worried, honestly, are when you lose that plane. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our monitoring. And then just kind of a a last thing, not to really just show the tumor roll out, but just to remind me to talk about that the a rostral and caudal ends of the tumor to me are the most challenging. You want to limit your myelotomy, but really these are the areas when I see residual in my cases where I could kick myself that I didn't make the appropriate myelotomy and make sure I reached the edge of the tumor and, and you know, and removing it. And, Really, that's, that's kind of the, the, the end of the surgical videos. So, you know, can we improve the resection rate? I mean, this is a curable tumor. And if we look at the literature, the resection rate, gross total resection rate is about 85%. I'm like, you know, couldn't or shouldn't that be better? Now, that may take all comers, may take some grade threes in there that are more difficult and may take some NF2 cases. We'll talk about that briefly, but you know, are there ways that we can improve the gross total resection rate? And you know, we almost all use intraoperative ultrasound. And although this is an older paper and this was a cavernoma, I kind of wanted you to compare the imaging we tend to get you know, during surgery with ultrasound with an MRI, and I think you know it, it's not even you know close, obviously. And um, you know one of the things that in this case in this tumor, I wanted you to uh, pay attention to, although it's difficult to see, and I can't really blow it up. That there's a little blip of tumor right here, and if you look at it, you know there's this little hemosiderin cap down here, and if I were even better. At, at doing what I do, I probably would have recognized that that little blip was a potential for, for um, uh, an area that we missed. Well, you know, like a lot of places, and I'm sure uh, at your institution, we have intraoperative MRI. And I was like, well, you know, a lot of these are at, uh, cervical or cervical thoracic junction. You know, could we actually use this? in more challenging cases, you know, if we were to reserve that sweep and get an MRI, if it wasn't one of these central tumors, you know, and we were a little bit worried about particularly those lateral components in the rostral and the caudal ends. And so we started looking at this and, you know, lo and behold, I did a case and I didn't really recognize that little piece of tumor that was uh, at the edge of, um, uh, you know, behind some uh, hemosiderin stain um, uh, spinal cord, and I missed it. And you can see the staples were already in because I was confident I got the whole thing right. You know, no way I left anything behind. And 
you know, we left the patient sterile other than, you know, with the staples in, we got this MRI and lo and behold, I'd left some behind and we went back and resected that. And, you know, we've now done a case series that we're going to publish, but, you know, probably, you know, in glioma resections, we're probably using intraoperative MRI, you know, uh, and making decisions in about a third or just under that of cases, especially low-grade gliomas, sometimes glioblastoma. But, you know, we're probably at the 10 or 11 percent in, in uh, spinal cord ependymoma. But I think, you know, that's, that's significant. I mean, if you can do one surgery and cure it, you know, we should be all about that. And just comparing, obviously, the imaging modality, you know, um, uh, one's certainly a lot, uh, a lot more specific than the other. And just uh, as a reminder, you know, with Ashok Asagiri here, uh, you know, who really specializes in tumor syndromes, NF2 and, and uh, BHL are, you know, so we see a lot of hemangioblastomas, we see a lot of NF2 associated spinal ependymomas. They are a different disease in NF2, and I call them, it's like, you know, kind of beads on a string or pearls on a string. It's a much more challenging operation. And a lot of times you're not going in on an F NF2 case to try to get every single spot. You're trying to address the most symptomatic levels because you're not going to cure this spinal cord likely of all ependymoma rests. So another time where intraoperative imaging could be very helpful. What we see, you know, uh, what I see, you know, when we look, how, how uh, caudal can we get with an MR image in kind of someone with a normal body habitus? Uh, you know, probably routinely down to about T3. So it's certainly not going to cover all spinal ependymomas, but for, you know, some of those challenging cervical ones where we're a little bit more tense up at C12, or, you know, certainly ones where, you know, we see very little um, cyst or searing associated with it and really have to rely on, on, on uh, dissection planes, I think it can be a nice adjunct. So let's about, talk about a little bit about what happens uh, post uh, intraoperatively really and postoperatively because they kind of meld together, you know, once uh, while we're removing tumor and what we're doing afterwards. So, you know, this question comes up, you know, how do we know when to stop and how do we balance that tumor resection with neurological outcome? So we use monitoring and we know monitoring, uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring does provide us with some close to real-time information regarding um, surgical insult to the spinal cord. Now, it may be a direct insult. It may be something uh, vascular where there's some compromise. It may be gentle dissection. Spinal cord doesn't like it. Doesn't matter whether it's MEPs, SSCP, D waves. We see it, and we know there are false positives and false negatives. But you know, the thing that we'd like to believe more is that you know, is there uh, any information that we get not only real time for oops something happened, but can we change that? And I think that's a much more challenging situation where the literature and our experience is not as clear. But you know, in the U.S., there are medical legal implications. Why? Well, um, you know, uh, there are guidelines and literature published that actually have you know a, a fairly voluminous number of class one and class two studies that show basically that um, patients who wake up with neurologic deficits generally had a significant event uh, to a high degree of reliability. So that's correlated. And the other half of that is that in all of these studies, there were no patients who woke up with a substantial neurologic deficit who did not have a finding. So maybe even more powerful there. Um, so, you know, this is now, of course, and, you know, the, you know, the folks that do monitoring, you know, have published these data and, you know, have, of course, declared it as a standard of care. And I think, you know, it's one of the things that's always lodged in our brains as we take these out, where the idea is to take the whole thing out. You know, you know uh, how much is neuromonitoring help, helping us or hindering us from doing that? And so, you know, I think in general, this is what I grew up with. Like, of course, if we don't have a good dissection plane, we're going to stop. But, you know, you know, one of the things that was kind of ingrained in our minds is like, well, motor or evoke potential is decreased by 50%. 
we should really stop. And, you know, I think some folks have really challenged that principle. And one of the uh, publications that I found to be interesting uh, was this one by Park and colleagues, where they kind of developed, you know, a set of criteria where either they looked at patients who stopped at the 50% decline, or those that allowed uh, the decline to continue to below 50%, uh, which resulted in a higher percentage of tumor, uh, gross total tumor resection, and, uh, and basically only stopped if they uh, completely lost motor signals. And if they looked at those two core cohorts of patients, that they actually found that the patients who went for this quote unquote all or none criteria actually did better neurologically over uh, the long haul. So at six months, the patients who use these all or none criteria and surgery continued past the 50% threshold had better outcomes. So again, small study, retrospective, you know, but when we deal with spinal cord ependymoma, there's not, there's not that many. I mean, I've looked at the SEER database before and there's probably somewhere around 200 of these undergoing surgical treatment you know, with pathological result in a, in a year. That may be a slight underestimate, but it goes to show you that, you know, they tend to crop up in, in areas, you know, that um, uh, have experience in doing this type of surgery. So, you know, if you look at most series, some deterioration of motor uh, function is, is generally reported. It's the one we worry about the most, although dorsal column dysfunction and loss of proprioception and uh, this disruption in, in, uh, in pain and temperature can be very disruptive, but we worry most about you know, the motor function and people ambulating and probably somewhere between most series 15 to 20% have long-term neurological deficits after surgery. Um, you know, just to keep in mind again, that during our myelotomy, we can make things better. If you test patients carefully after surgery, most will have some type of proprioceptive uh, deficit. Uh, fortunately, most improve if we get that right during the dorsal column dissection. Spinal thalamic tract, uh, you know, we probably pay less attention to that, but it certainly uh, occurs as well. You know, I just put in a word that when we see patients worsen after surgery, that you know, obviously, if you don't have, if you don't do intraoperative MRI, but even if you do. Uh, looking at those patients and making sure we don't have an intramedullary hematoma or on a rare occasion when a case presents, a tumor presents with significant edema that we can get, you know, and we do a nice tight dural closure, we can see compression there. So one time in my career, you know, I had to take a patient back and open the dura up, let things settle down, and then uh, close it later in a, in a stage surgery. You know, overall, people tend to, to get better, although I think there's this three-month rule uh, where sensory deficits tend to be fixed at three months uh, and uh, motor deficits still may improve. I find motor deficits can improve probably out to about 18 months. Uh, sensory deficits are just so much more difficult, and I think that depends on whether this is a dissection injury to the spinothalamic tract or a dorsal column injury, because I do think those dorsal columns tend to improve with, with time, uh, which with a, a much greater uh, rate. So what's our evidence though that we can improve with, um, uh, you know, if, if our neuromonitoring colleagues tell us that we have a decrement or we've lost signals, what can we do? There's no class one or class two evidence that say we can change their outcome. Although we all have that laundry list of things we do, we check for hematoma, we get the the um, you know, ultrasound out, we talked to our anesthesia colleagues, make sure the guy coming in for a relief didn't actually um, put paralytics on board. We check all our technical things, we raise the maps, we give steroids and all those things are, are great. But you know, again, just thinking of that kind of quandary with intraoperative neuromonitoring, it reminds me of something, uh, a quote that Dr. Jane used to always tell us from Hamlet and Rod and Steve, Others will remember this. Uh, thus, conscious does make cowards of us all. So, knowing about a thing really has us thinking about that thing. And you know, I think 
really developing a perspective uh, and really doing a prospective study if we could about you know what we what can, we can and can uh, change with intraoperative neuro monitoring when we're stopping short when we should be taking tumor out and of course when we're going to have fixed neurologic deficits so although the the literature is sparse when it comes to uh, spinal injury uh, with um, uh, intramedullary spinal cord tumors, not so sparse when it comes to spinal cord injury of other sources. And this is a paper by Greg Harlock and, and Jeff Manley from UCSF that, that talk about it. And they did a really elegant study that really said there is definitely a correlation between uh, mean arterial pressure value and neurologic recovery and spinal cord injury and supported that seven day time that, and I'm not sure what the, you guys do, maybe we could chat about that, uh, you know, at Swedish, but, you know, uh, this is one of those things where there's a lot of variability in practice. I think the thing in talking with our neuroanesthesiologist and, and looking at this paper that we tend not to think about as much is the amount of uh, hypotension that occurs during surgery in the early postoperative course. And they actually reached the conclusion that the duration of periods of hypotension may be more important than the average math, although we kind of target 85 and, you know, that's been our mantra. So, you know, this has caused me to, to really think about this a lot. And so, you know, when I go in to see my patient in um, surgical admission suite and the anesthesiologist is around, the first thing I ask is, what's the patient's baseline math? And I don't want to see it below that, you know, and that means, you know, induction, even though it might go down to, you know, it's momentary in that we're going to run the patient uh, at the patient's baseline maps during surgery. So, you know, you know, they think for a normal patient, uh, based on uh, a, a map of 60 is fine. Well, in a lot of cases where, you know, uh, I think you're uh, doing, you know, maybe routine degen, you know, that's fine. But when you're doing something where we know the spinal cord is compromised either by compression or from a vascular standpoint, you know, it's probably not um, significant. And so we have this conversation ahead of time and I don't want them to forget it. So every time, we go into the room, it is specified, you know, there's no one, there's someone in our group that doesn't think A lines are necessary. Uh -uh. Everyone gets an A line, everybody gets their map, and we keep those maps uh, up throughout the procedure. And, and I think then, you know, it eliminates that, that idea that, you know, when we see a decline in, in, the, in the maps, at least we're or in signals that we're taking that out of the loop, right? We're already there. And so almost everybody that we're operating on has a map usually of 80 or above. And if when the patient wakes up and I take them to the ICU, if they have any increased deficit, I go ahead and run their maps up for three days, not seven days, but at three days, I'll wean, particularly for, for motor deficits, I'll wean uh, that map and examine the patient closely you know, every hour. And if there's any decline in the exam, doing really detailed exams, then I'll keep the map up for a full seven days. But I, I found that fairly rare in my practice. So one last topic I wanted to, uh, to, to touch on and hopefully um, finish on time is spinal deformity after spinal cord tumor surgery, particularly with ependymoma. And you know, this is one of the things and another thing we can think about at the time of surgery and something a nuance that I think we can improve. Um, we know that postoperative spinal deformity is more, uh, more common in children, but does happen in adult and both in adult and children. Cervical deformity is more common than thoracic, which is way more common than lumbar. You know, we've seen that and I'm going to draw some attention to how we do our laminectomy, you know, uh, our paraspinal mus musculature and the closure, because I think all of these are important uh, considerations. And, you know, one of the things to remember is that if we get cervical kyphosis, particularly uh, thoracic as well, that we can get bowstring of the, of the spinal cord across that kyphus, and it can lead to significant neurologic imp impairment. So 
kids, you know, I think, you know, uh, consideration of doing the laminoplasty is really important. You need to think about that ahead of time. I tend not to do a lot of kids in my practice, but, you know, I think one of the things is, is that even in adults that we want to fix this early because we know what happens. I mean, there's a lot of uh, people who do spine surgery and uh, we know what that gets us into. So just a reminder, you know, that the, the cervical um, spine has normally about 15 degrees of lordosis. And because of that, that the, the weight-bearing axis is actually posterior to the vertebral bodies. And so as opposed to lumbar spine, uh, low trend, uh, transmission is a smaller percentage, uh, a little more than a third through the anterior column and much more uh, low transmission through the posterior columns. And we need to keep that in mind and let it guide how, how we do these operations. So, you know, obviously with, with kyphosis, the, 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 the musculature, especially in patients who have had laminectomies tend to go from a force of extension to one of flexion. And that's why, you know, we'll talk about, you know, repair of the musculature and layers carefully is really important to do because it's still providing a, a significant amount of stability to the spine, maintaining alignment. And of course, you know, muscular diastasis, whenever I see it, it is one of those warning signs, we're gonna have a problem. So what are the risk factors for having deformity after, um, after um, uh, ependymoma surgery? Um, Pre-existing kyphosis is certainly one of those that we have to keep an eye on. In fact, I had that conversation with our older folks who have significant degen. And then, you know, the more we, mo we remove of the lamina and, and the ligament, you know, whether it's interspinal ligaments, whether it's um, um, uh, ligamentum flavum, you know, has an effect. And we have to keep in mind, we have to know this tumor and that knowing that we don't need to expose the whole syrinx. We can just expose the solid part. We're doing a midline um, myelotomy. So why do we need to take more than 50% of the facet? So carefully taking our facets, if we're gonna do, you know, um, you know uh, drill troughs out, make sure we know where those facets are and try not to compromise those facets except for the, 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 the smallest uh, number of levels and make sure that, you know, we try to keep, you know, less than, you know, 25% or less uh, facet compromised when we do our laminectomies. And this is something that Chris used to pound into the residents. Like he said, all you residents think that, you know, there's just this one amorphous neck muscle and you just put big O, o vicral sutures through the whole thing and expect it to, to perform the way it normally does. And that's certainly, not the case. There are layers of muscle that we need to close sequentially in order for them to, to function optimally. And the last thing is a reminder, just because we see a pendymoma in the upper cervical spine, which is that the semispinalis cervicus, you know, it uh, provides about 30% of the neck extension. And that when we take that, that there's a direct correlation. And, and this is a 20 year old paper now between kyphotic deformity and, uh, and taking C2. If you need to take C2 and you need to take semispinalis cervicus, then do it. If not, you know, be careful. And this is one of my patients, can't put this on anyone else. This patient had a, a C3 tumor, but you can see I, you know, I almost certainly, you know, I looked at the operative note, took down the muscle at C2 and followed this patient for a period of time. And then they, they got this kyphotic deformity, unfortunately, that necessitated a second operation. And what we all dread is this, where this wasn't my case, but a multi-level laminectomy for a cervical pendymoma. They had had the patient in a collar for a couple of years, which of course didn't prevent, but you know, huge muscular diastasis behind all that muscle pouring, pulling the patient down into kyphosis. Uh, one of the things to remember is, of course, that traction is your friend, especially, thankfully, in flexible curves. You know, we pop this patient in traction and we're able to do, unfortunately, a big operation, but put them back into alignment and get their chin off their chest. So just a reminder to us all that if we do this the right way, we can certainly prevent this type of operation in the future. Um, 
just a, a word about clinical outcomes. You know, we'd like to think they're better than they are. About 40% of patients improve if you look at a number of series. Uh, uh, about, you know, 45 to 50% are stable, but 15%, you know, we said 15 to 20% get worse. Uh, surgery is really the primary treatment for, for ependymoma, you know, probably first, second, and third time, you know, and uh, for grade two, for grade three, you know, you can bring in XRT and chemo, but unfortunately you're kind of into, you know, into some bear country there. I have a patient, a grade three patient now who I'm on uh, taking out his third seedling from, um, you know, from uh, his, um, uh, subarachnoid spread of his disease. And, you know, we're just waiting for things to grow all that's been radiated before and uh, thankfully able to keep the patient walking. But if you look at all these series on adjuvant treatment for intramedullary spinal cord tumor, the, the evidence is terrible and the results are, are not very good. So, you know, um, keep in mind that surgery is our best treatment. So, just some lessons learned, OFI nuances, intraoperative imaging, you know, can be very helpful. If you have an intraoperative MRI, put it to work. Uh, you know, we will publish our series and I think it's kind of a nice example of, you know, when it's come in, in handy. Um, you know, because our goal is gross total resection of these tumors that, although intraoperative neuromyelinating gives us some insights and it's directly correlated to immediate postoperative outcome, you know, it's our legal standard of care, and there is some evidence that that you know that 50% mark may be keeping us from doing uh, better tumor removals at times where you know that is going to be a better, a bigger determinant of outcome. And make sure you develop a mean arterial pressure strategy before you get in the room that you're going to follow during surgery. So here's this all or none approach that part advocated, you know, in his paper. So remember that in the end, it's direct observation or tumor plane that probably is our biggest guiding line, uh, our, our guiding light. And finally, you know, if we're going to prevent spinal deformity, uh, let's, you know, limit the laminectomies, spare the C2 musculature if possible, do those laminoplasties, especially in kids. And remember, you know, the, the wall of those syrinxes are, are non-neoplastic. And um, so don't have to expose all those. So that helps us. Um, I've started closing all my cervical cases with uh, longer lasting suture like a PDS or a Stratifix. And I will say I haven't seen a muscular diastasis in those cases since then. So that's definitely been a change in my practice. So present, if you do see progressive kyphotic deformity, fix it early, don't wait it out. We know what's gonna happen and just a final reminder that first, second, and third best options are for residual recurrent grade two tumor is surgery. So get back in there, a little more challenging, but it'll come out and uh, not that much more challenging than the initial surgery. So I'll end there, I think almost on time. So happy to take any questions or any comments or disagreements, uh, thoughts? Mark, that was a terrific uh, talk and, um, you know, rem reminds me of uh, what a great um, program, um, you know, the University of Virginia is and, um, you know, what a tremendous job you've done just in terms of, um, you know, uh, pushing the envelope forward in neuro-oncology um, and, um, you know, some of those cases you showed and I always reference the Lancet article for the fellows whenever we have a spinal ependymoma <laughs> case. Um, that's a great paper that you wrote. Um, and I think, you know, it just, it's a testament to the University of Virginia and the training program um, and the history there. And I think, you know, um, when I think of my training, uh, you know, there isn't one single the training there is just unbelievable, and for a small town, it's it's crazy the cases that that you guys get, um, and um, I think, you know, the the cases that you showed um, are, uh, you know, it's it's very interesting to kind of see the pathology, and also 
The other thing I was going to say, Mark, is do you think in the last 10 years, do you find yourself um, using like lasers or do you use a CUSA? What are some, what are some other, you know, I know um, just because I've operated with you, you know, you, you do use some of these techniques. Um, what are your thoughts on these, you know, newer devices that come out like the laser? Well, uh, don't use a laser because I'm a little afraid of, of, of containing the heat. Um, you know, uh, some may, but, you know, probably in my hands wouldn't be as good. I do use Sakusa if it tends to be a, a larger tumor, just touching it with it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do want, you know, residents to learn to take these out. And, you know, I don't put in a lot of peel retraction sutures and maybe some people do. I do worry about, you know, as you're learning to do these, you know, uh, that, you know, sometimes, you know, kind of a, a less accurate CUSA, you know, uh, can, you know, potentially cause some damage to the dorsal columns or, you know, particularly lateral, you know, like, you know, knowing to just like tap that pedal instead of like, you know, it's not even full pressure. You tap it and you look at that and you yeah. look at that tumor start to come away from it and you actually it gives you a gauge of how thick the tumor is left. And so I do look, use CUSA and, you know, because doing it with scissors, although is precise, it takes a lot longer. So I, I do like the CUSA. I think that, and probably uh, just posting them in the Emmer suite, you know, and I won't say that, you know, you, we probably, you know, again, you know, it'll come out in the paper, but, you know, we certainly don't MRI everybody, but I do think, you know, for cases where we're really, you know, want to make sure we have it and for probably for NF2, it's invaluable. Um, but those are probably the things I would say, like the most recent change in my practice is just, you know, because Vicro starts to weaken, like after like 10 days, and, and you start to think about it is like as much as you turn flex extend your neck, you know, how much is that uh, is Vicro gonna like really be there when you want it two or three weeks mm -hmm. later when you're not fully healed so I think you know PDS, you know, it, it doesn't start to weaken for weeks and of course some of these new PDS of course they're they're faster too, you know, like some of these things with the barbs on the PDS suture where you just go through, it tightens up well, you don't have to worry about the knots loosening. I think it's actually a good strategy, although that's been fairly recent, although I've been using PDS for uh, routinely for more than a few years now. So, you know, I, I will say, you know, just think about that in your closures. And, you know, there's nothing that makes me more sick than seeing a patient come back, you know, after a posterior cervical operation with muscular diastasis that patient's gonna have lifelong neck pain. I mean, unless you go back in, pull it all together, you know, which you can do, but you talk to a patient about that, most of them say, well, it's not that bad, mm -hmm. you know, but it is, it's a terrible problem. I mean, Rod, what, what do you do or Jens or, you know, you know, do you guys uh, have any strategy there? No, I mean, I think the closure is, is paramount. And I think, yeah. you know, again, I don't know, um, the other thing, Mark, I don't know if you talked about, actually, Steve uh, was in the chat box talking about it, whether you use Duracell or other sealants. But I think, you know, what I learned from you and, you know, all the attendings at UVA is, you know, the, the dural closure is very important. And getting them, you know, I remember as a junior resident, when you would go over with me, you know, all the different layers, the fascia, the muscle, you know, getting a good good closure on those neck cases because it's so important. And some, I think probably some of those cases, the deformity cases you were showing, I do think they play a, a, a big role in, you know, them going on and, and developing these deformities, so. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. And I mean, remembering there's three layers to close, you know, uh, not one, you know, again, uh, one, uh, you know, Chris never minced words, you know, as you know, but I mean, he would just absolutely, yeah. you know, lay in, uh, you know, people, you know, who, you know, like did the one layer ovicral closure, you know, knowing that, you know, it's, it, it really is one of those things that it's a disservice to our patient. I mean, 
it's created in layers for a reason and yeah. we need to close it that way. And then one last thing, Mark, um, is what are your, so just, if it's three levels or more, is there a cutoff? Like, when do you think about fusing someone or do you try not to kind of? I try not, you know, that's to me, Rod, more for uh, a consideration I have for intradural extramedullaries, you know, mm -hmm. a dumbbell schwannoma or, right. or uh, right. you know, you know, I, I tend to think, you know, cause then the facets already generally enlarged uh, or thinned at that level. You know, they probably have some mechanical deformity and trying to tease that out, you know, from the radicular component is hard. But remember, I mean, if we're careful, you know, I think, you know, facet preservation, you know, can occur. And the simple fact that I, I'm seeing less and less of it in, in my patients is a sign that, you know, look, remember the operation we're doing with the pendomoma. It's a midline myelotomy. And we can be more conservative in our rostral caudal extent and the a number of uh, uh, the percent of facet we're taking. And, you know, in those cases where we used to just kind of get down there and, oh, we can feel C2 and kind of just start, um, uh, you know, just open, detach the muscle, you know, for a nice open view. We just need to be a little more thoughtful about that. Yeah. Well, Mark, uh, I... I can't tell you, um, you know, what an honor it is to have you talk. And, you know, we feel like we're always copying everything um, that you guys have done at UVA. And um, uh, I'm really proud of, you know, the work that you've done and continued Dr. Jane's legacy and teaching. And, um, you know, we're excited, really excited to have Tony join us. And, oh, yeah. You guys have, a, yeah. you've got a great, piece of Charlottesville uh, yeah. on top of all that other expertise you have there. So we need, we needed an extra boost here. You know, I've, I've been se 17 years since I left. So, yeah. and, and uh, you know, we're really excited and I think you're going to um, enjoy Dr. Elias. And, uh, you know, like I said, you, we feel like we're part of your, uh, we're the UVA on the West coast. Yeah, so we, we consider, and thanks so much you did for everything you did to preserve, uh, and enhance Dr. Jane's legacy because, you know, that's important to everybody who trained with him. Yeah. Thanks again, Mark. Really okay. appreciate um, You guys have a nice talk. cool day out there yeah. in Seattle today, okay? Well, Thank do. you, Dr. Chaffee. Thanks, Elias. See you Thanks, in a month. Mark. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye. Right, okay. Bye-bye.